Welcome to the uh, Jerry Reynolds Show here at the beautiful studios of uh, McCreary's uh, Home Furnishings. And not only do we have a great studio here, but you can uh, buy some of the greatest furniture in the Sacramento area. And certainly it's been that way for decades. But uh, really exciting time for me here today because uh, as our guest, you know, we have maybe the, the most gifted radio announcer and certainly a, a, a celebrity here in Sacramento for many, many years. And I would also say uh, he may not want to take credit for this, but he was certainly been a mentor to me for, for years as well, Mr. Gary Gerald. Well, wow, I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you, Jerry. So, you know, I, I guess just uh, one of the things I want to start off with, it's always been interesting, you know, and in we've been together for 35 years, mm -hmm. uh, basically. And and I still go a lot of places, and people will, will call me G-Man. And I've always said that. That's Works both ways. Yeah, I've always said, well, that's, you know, I said, that's a very much a compliment. <laughs> I take it that way. If you think, you know, I'll, <laughs> because I'll say, well, I'm not G-Man, but I'm Jerry Reynolds or something. And then they'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, no, don't be sorry. That's, <laughs> that's give, give me a little bit. Yeah, I usually, I, never, I don't quite know how to handle that in a situation. Can I say, okay, do I tell them that I'm not Jerry? Or do I let them believe that I am Jerry? Yeah. And then if they want to do a photo or a selfie or something like that, I say, you better understand that I'm Gary. I'm not Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> you just play it by No, ear. no, it's, it is a little bit. And <laughs> it I, happens and, frequently. And I get it a little bit, too, where people say, oh, yeah, Jerry, uh, put it in the book and send them to the line. I said, well, what? I don't. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, yeah. But hey, you know, I mean, you know, people Bless mean the fans, well. As you know, I mean, they mean well, and that's that's the the key. They mean yeah. mean it as a compliment. And I guess the 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 thing I want to get into a little bit is because I I mean, obviously, your career is what it is. Obviously, we you know, which is fantastic. But I'd like to go back where it all started. I think Midland, Michigan, and uh, you might not believe this, but I've actually been to Midland. Is Michigan. that right? Yeah, the, there's a a junior college in that area, I think yes. Midland, Saginaw, and, and uh, some are together. Yeah, there's uh, Northwood Institute was in Midland itself, was a JC, and then there's the couple of others in the Saginaw area that I remember. Yeah, there, it's, is, anyway, it's going a couple back a few kind years. of combined, but, uh, you yeah. know, as a junior college coach, we, we played up there a mm -hmm. couple times, so I have been to Midland, and, yeah. and I can understand why you don't live there now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, as a young uh, young lad, and I was looking through a biography, and I thought it was really kind of interesting, where at age 15, it said you, you went and did some radio work at, at a telegraph Station or what? Well, no, or, there was a, a, a neighborhood radio station. Uh, I grew up in this in this small town and about a mile from my home. My father died when I was very young, and my mother was frequently ill, and I was I didn't have any siblings, and I would kind of forced to live on my own a bit. Mm -hmm. I stayed with our minister's family. I stayed with neighbors at different times when my mom was ill, uh, but the radio station became, when I was about 13 years old, it became a second home. And I literally went there every day. After school, whatever, I'd take care of my paper route, then I would go to the radio station and I would just hang out and spend the night there. And so, you know, it's funny, at a very young age, I, I got a fairly good grasp of what small town radio was about. And because I always wanted to be a sports broadcaster or a broadcaster of some type, it was just kind of a natural fit. Uh-huh. That, uh, I've always find that so interesting. Just talk, you know, talking with some other people in the business, and it's always it seems so intriguing and consistent that the people who seem to make it are the ones who really made great sacrifices. You know, started out just basically saying, you know, whatever I can do to yeah. to, to to get experience, I'll do. And at that time, you know, I'm I'm looking ahead. I'm thinking about going to college. There were very few universities or colleges around the country that had broadcast curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really know that at the time. But, you know, as, as the years have rolled by, it has become so immensely popular and it's become so competitive. And now every, not every high school, but many high schools, virtually any junior college, any college and university has some kind of a broadcast program mm -hmm. where you can get great hands-on experience. Well, I didn't have that luxury but that's where, you know, being able to spend all of those days in a small town radio station. And they gave me a show when I was a teenager. It was a once a week type of a deal. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I could set in with the other, um, the disc jockeys and 
kind of hang out and be part of their show, and they would give me maybe a 15-minute little window uh-huh. where I could kind of do my own thing. And it was really, it was a terrific opportunity. And I, I look back on it now with a great deal of fondness because it did establish, I think, a pretty good base. And then when I did go to college, I went to a school in Indiana, uh, Anderson. Anderson College. And it was college fact. at the time, university now, a uh, small school, 1,200 students. It was church-supported. And uh, I went there with the full intent that I'd spend the first couple of years, which everybody told me were pretty basic, no mm-hmm. matter where you went to, to college, and then would transfer to possibly a Mich- North, Northwestern or a Michigan State that in the Midwest were, were a couple of schools that had broadcast you had, uh-huh. curriculum. And uh, I found that I liked the small campus environment. I liked the atmosphere, and I, I ended up staying, and I never made the transfer. But part of that was because I had that kind of practical experience early on. And then in the summers, I'd go home, and I'd work full-time at the radio station. Now, did you do anything uh, for at Anderson College in relation to broadcasting, any uh, sporting events or anything like that? No, I was a public address announcer uh, for, oh, is that right? for football and worked the sidelines with a hellaciously long cord and a microphone and kind of did a public address play-by-play. It kind of filled a play-by-play void in that Uh sense. And I worked uh, on the the school's news bureau and I worked with the basketball team and I traveled with them. And and, uh, in fact, I got a Christmas card just recently here from a fellow remembering how we had this old Ford station wagon that my wife Marlene and I had. And uh, I would drive guys and we, you know, there were occasional road trips where we'd Mm -hmm. go to Virginia or whatever, and it might be an overnighter or it might be driving all night. Yeah. And I'd have four or five players in that station wagon, and there'd be like three vehicles, and we'd drive from Indiana to wherever to play a game and then drive back home. Yeah, I was going to say, now that's, I mean, that's very familiar with, you know, when I started in, co- in coaching in junior college, assistant coach and, and later head coach and different things. And, but, you know, you often we drive cars and, oh, yeah. and you know, go for three or four hundred miles or and play games like you say. Well, and young, stay forward to a room maybe and if yeah. uh, <laughs> and you know, sometimes it's a van or whatever, but but I mean, yeah, that was you know, that was the life, wasn't it? Today's athletes would scoff at that. Oh they, boy, they, they would do they some, wouldn't believe it. You they'd know. do some yeah. major scoffing, yeah. wouldn't they? There wasn't uh, there wasn't funding to you know, handle transportation and to handle meals and one thing or another. It was really a tight budget. Really tight budget, you yeah. know. And I but you know, it's one of those things too. At the time it's like, well, you didn't think about it. I nope. mean that's the way it was done. Exactly. And and you know, and you're really doing something you liked, enjoyed doing, you know, yeah. you really didn't think about it. I've always said, you know, looking back, I I can't imagine myself enjoying painting locker rooms and cleaning <laughs> and cleaning the floor for games and things like that. But or taking all the you uni- taking all the uniforms home to my wife to wash, you know, yeah. things like that. But that's what you did exactly. if you wanted to to be have a job or do a job right. But you know, to the uh, you know, just thinking back, you know, I mean, in your career, and, and of course, I'm not aware of all of it, but I know just exactly how you, how did you get to Sacramento from Anderson. Well, a couple of interesting stories along the uh, along the way, and, and I, I don't want to bore you and our, our audience, but it, uh, one story, when I was, Marlene and I were married, we're in Michigan, my hometown in Midland, I'm working full time, and it was in the fall, it was in football season, and I went to hang out at one of the uh, local broadcasts of the football game, and football was a pretty big deal. We had a state championship team during the years, uh, those years in, in Midland, and so the sports director from the radio station is calling the game. I'm just sitting in the booth. He goes out to have a smoke or a beer or whatever at halftime, and he never came back. And the station what? manager, who was the engineer, he turned to me and he said, I guess you're going to call the second half of this game. Wow. And I, you know, no preparation. I had a scorecard that had names and numbers, called the second half of the game and ended up doing the rest of the season. And the sports director was no longer the sports director. He was terminated a couple of days later. And I, I to this day, I don't know what happened or what transpired, but it was kind of interesting how that evolved. Well, then, just a few months later, we're in basketball season. I'm doing all the basketball games on the local radio station. And I get a call from uh, California, and it was my father-in-law, who was a minister in Chico. And uh, he was going into KHSL in Chico, radio station, one day. Uh, He did recordings to lead in and lead out of 
half-hour religious programming that, according to the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, to maintain your license, you had to have a certain number of hours annually. And so mm -hmm. he would do the lead-in and the lead-out to these syndicated uh, religious shows that aired Sunday mornings. In the course of going into the station this one day, the program director at KHSL was a fiery little Lebanese guy. His name was Don Baroda. And he came storming out of his office, he saw my father-in-law and said, Preacher, what am I going to do? I just had to fire so-and-so, and I don't know what we're going to do to replace him. And my father-in-law, who was a large, stoic man, said, well, you know, I have a son-in-law in Michigan who's in radio. Preacher, get him on the phone right now. <laughs> really? <laughs> Two weeks later, Marlene and I are driving cross-country to Chico, California. Wow. It was so crazy. So now, uh, you know, <laughs> had you, after that, did, I mean, obviously you must have negotiated with him, or, or they, you knew there was a job there for sure. I, oh, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. They, they made an offer made for an a offer. job, and, and so, so we, you know, came to Chico, and I did a little bit of news. I did music, uh, tried to want to be involved in doing sports, but again, a, you know, a small sure. market station you did a little bit of everything bit. and so i get an extra i believe it was ten dollars a week to do uh high school games football or basketball they also did a couple of junior college uh in the in northern california region up yeah. around redding uh -huh. and um, i do those games you get another extra ten dollars which was huge sure in those days you know to get an extra twenty dollars in your paycheck a week that was a big deal to a young married couple oh, with a young three-month-old child. So Absolutely. It, was, uh, it was interesting the way that kind of evolved. And then while we were there, we were in Chico for two years, and they did not have any local news programming at KHSL Television. And they decided that they were going to start a local news show. And they came and said, would you be interested in doing sports? Well, I knew absolutely nothing at that time about television. Mm -hmm. And basically what it was, I would set just almost like this, and I would do a five-minute radio sportscast except to a camera. To a camera. Five nights a week, for which I got another, you know, 10 bucks a night or something uh -huh. like that. Yeah. And I began to learn a little bit about studio presence and awareness of cameras and started to kind of by osmosis learn a little bit about the television the business, business. yeah. And then if I jump ahead just a little bit, I get a phone call totally out of the blue one day. It's a fellow in Sacramento by the name of Bill Zimlick, who passed away many, many years ago. He was an icon in this area in the broadcast business on the radio side. He was involved at KHS, at KCRA Radio, and he said, there's an opening. He said, you don't know me, and he introduced himself. Mm -hmm. He said, there's an opening in the sports department at KCRA Television, and I think you need to contact so-and-so and inquire about this position. And I'm a little skeptical. I mean, well... Television, Sacramento, okay, I'll call. Ended up spending a day in Sacramento with Dave Hume, who was the news director at KCRA Television at that time. And they talked a lot of theory and one thing or another and, you know, learning a little bit about me and, and the give and take process. And I, wasn't, I had never done an audition. And he says, let's go down to the studio. And he says, why don't you prepare, you know, we'll do a three-minute you know, sports cast. So, you know, I went and got a couple of things and did my usual, like, mm -hmm. radio thing, but to a camera. And we finished that, and Dave Hume walked up to me, and he kind of looked at me, and he says, that was really good. Have you been doing a lot of these? And I said, well, sir, that's actually the first time I've ever, <laughs> ever done I'm, one. I'm one for one right now. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't know if this is good, bad, or am I, you know, telling him I've only done it one time? Am I slicing my own throat here or yeah. what? But at any rate, a couple of weeks later, they offered me a job. And so we ended up moving to, uh, to Sacramento. And, and still here. Still here. So, yeah, now, so, now, so you did uh, sports on TV for how many years then here? On, In that? Sacramento, let's see, 1965 was when we started. 1977 was when it, when it ended. When it ended. I was unceremoniously dumped. The, well, uh, well, they, they screwed <laughs> up. And you, and you they never... Had, uh, they were research... Uh, was relatively new to the broadcast business at that time. And they had a firm that was based in the Midwest, and it was that firm's uh, decision that they needed a little more fire and pizzazz and one thing or another mm -hmm. uh, from the sports guy. And yeah. I was the sports guy. And so. uh, I had decided somewhere along the line, maybe one of the first times that I ever started to, you know, kind of stand up for myself, I'm not going to try to be something that I am yeah, not. Yeah, that you're not. You know, right. it's just you either like what you have here, 
but I'm not going to create some phony persona to right. try to satisfy your demands. Can't be Ron Burgundy, can you? Well, probably could have tried, but <laughs> <laughs> elected not to. No, no, I think that's a good. <laughs> so then, after after that experience, what where we, what was your next? Well, then the decision was whether do we try to establish a new identity in a new market. We loved California. Uh, so I started making inquiries, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Um, the credentials from working the 12 years at KCRA were really good because KCRA's news operation at that time, well, when I came in there, I was, there were like 55 people in the news department, mm -hmm. which was much larger than any of the news operations in San Francisco or Los Angeles. And I quickly began to learn that KCRA was held in great esteem, not only by folks in the western uh, west coast but around the country around for that the country. matter and so it was really i'm thinking well this is really good you know so you've got a background here and maybe it'll work out but then we started thinking more about it do we really want to go to a new market try to establish an identity all over again there were things that we enjoyed a great deal about sacramento i was doing a number of freelance type things you know we were eking out an existence and we made the decision to stay just to stay we also made the decision as a family uh, son, a daughter, my wife, uh, that we're going to make this the best thing that's ever happened to us. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, it was, it was the yeah. best thing. Well, I mean, I mean you... there were some tough times in there trying to maintain the faith. Mm -hmm. Bob Kelly, to his everlasting credit, was one of the owners of KCRA Television. Uh, he and his brother, John, and John and I, we didn't mix. We didn't mm -hmm. get along real well. Bob, however, was the thinker, and he was looking out for me, and he kept telling me about different opportunities, and there was an opportunity. He said, there's a new show that NBC is producing. It's a sports anthology show out of New York. It's called Sports World. I think you would be tailor-made for it. So for three months, Jerry, every day of every business day, I would get up in the morning, and I would call Don Olmeyer's office in New York City mm -hmm. at 30 Rock sure. and try to get you know, an audience with him. And, of course, every day he was in a meeting, he wasn't available, we'll have him call, blah, blah, blah. It never happened. I never left the house until I knew it was beyond 5 o'clock Eastern time. Mm -hmm. So I was locked in because I didn't want to miss that phone call yeah. if it came. Sure. Of course, we didn't have the cell phones, cell phones one or thing anything. or another. And uh, eventually there was an opportunity that evolved. It wasn't directly through Don Omar, but it opened the door at NBC. And I started doing a handful of events, and they somehow got me into kind of the regular mix. And so in the, this was in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, I started working on a fairly regular basis as an independent contractor freelancer for NBC mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. of New York. Now then, uh, obviously when the, uh, the King's situation came, what, 85, uh, how did you, how did that all come about i mean uh, well that's a, that's kind of a fascinating story and i hope it's not too lengthy but i'll try to condense it you know gregory dutch van dusen sure he was involved with the ownership group from sacramento that owned the kansas city kings for the last couple of years of mm -hmm. their existence one day in january in 1985 i get a phone call again out of the blue and it's dutch van dusen he says gary i want to play what if with you and i said Okay. <laughs> he said, what if the Kansas City Kings were to move to Sacramento? Would you be interested in being the radio play-by-play -play voice? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I mean, I was stammering. I was so stunned to hear this. And I said, well, of course. I said, now I'd probably have to have some consideration made because of the network obligations I have with NBC. And he said, that would not be a problem. Let me assure you. I didn't hear anything. A few more weeks go by. I get a phone call from Paul Aaron, who is the general manager at KFBK Radio here in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. He said, Gary, uh, two days from now, I'm going to Kansas City to see the Kings play, and I don't remember who they were playing. Uh, would you like to go along with me and maybe meet some of the people in the organization? And so I'm thinking, there must be something to this business because if Paul Aaron, who I don't know from KFBK Radio, is going there... And wants to take you. He wants me to go along and meet some of these people... I better jump all over this, and I did. And yeah. we went to Kansas City. We got there, and I met Joe Axelson, who was the general manager, mm -hmm. Bob Witsit, who was his assistant, assistant that time. Uh, Julie Fye, who was the media relations director, Kevin Harlan was doing the games on radio that season for yes, the Kansas City Kings. And, you know, we had a chance to say hello and meet and greet, watch the ball game, 
stayed that night and then flew back to Sacramento the next day. Another few weeks go by, and then I get a phone call saying, the Kings are coming west. They're going to play two games against the Lakers and the Warriors. I want you to go and record those games into a tape recorder. And we want to, you know, listen to your style or whatever. I didn't tell them that it had been 15 years since I had last done basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't think that was a problem. But I didn't know the NBA game. I didn't know the personnel and yeah, the, the players personnel and that well. Yeah. I didn't know, you know, the rules and some of the nuances. And I was a little concerned about that. My son, Bobby, was a teenager at that time. Took him out of school and said, Bob, you're going to be my other set of eyes and you're going to help do some stats. Of course, he loved the idea. Mm -hmm. We went to L.A. We stayed at the airport Marriott where the Kings were staying. Uh, Bill Jones, our longtime friend yeah, who was uh, the, best. The, the trainer and absolutely the best, uh, was welcoming and was kind. And he said, be down in the lobby at such and such a time. We'll take a shuttle from here to the forum for tonight's ball game. So Bobby and I are down there. We get on the shuttle and here's... Reggie Theus and Eddie Johnson and Larry Drew and Mark Olberding and Otis Thorpe, and they're looking around, and I can just see them thinking, who the hell are these yeah, guys? Yeah, what, are these? What, what are they doing here? Why are they going with us? Bill Jonesy's just said basically, you know, explain the situation, trust him, everything's good. They treated us kindly. They were welcoming with open arms. I couldn't have been, couldn't have been more gracious. Mm -hmm. And what a relief, because that was a very intimidating situation to be in. Oh, it had to be. I mean, you know, just to, like I say, I can just imagine, I mean, you know, not really knowing the league, obviously, like like it's so comfortable for you now. I mean, <laughs> and, and, but I always wonder, too, the, those players, you know, as you know, I mean, they, they represent they were, just they were great guys. Top, top of the line they were guys, guys, guys all time. And really. remain great guys. And we remain great guys. And we went, we went to the game. We're up, up in the nosebleeds, uh, a couple of rows above the legendary Chick Hearn. Mm -hmm. And Chick loved being up. The bird's yeah. eye view at the forum. Only guy in the world that And really I never that. could understand that. Uh -uh. And so here I am trying to discern who these people are, trying to call a game into a tape recorder. Then we fly to Oakland and do the same thing at the war, with the Warriors. But in Oakland, we were much closer to the floor, and Bobby's keeping some stats and some numbers for me. And so we do that, and little did I know at the time, that's what Joe Axelson, who was then the general manager of the Kings, he listened to those tapes when the decision had been made and they were re relocating to Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And as he drove cross-country from Kansas City, he listened to those tapes. And he later told me, he said, kid, you were a hell of a lot better than you had any right to be. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Joe. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, he, he nailed it. But that's how the whole thing evolved. And, mm. and it was just, I mean, you remember, you know, when the Kings first came to Sacramento, the absolute fever, it was a fever pitch. People were so starved for a professional sports identity. And the Kings were going to provide that. Mm -hmm. And the initial sellout streak was close to 500 games or whatever. And, you know, they had the temporary building that Greg Lukenbill put up. Oh, and it was 10,333. There you go. Yeah. Postage stamp, locker rooms. Jonesy was taping ankles out in the hallway. Well, you know, the visiting teams would crazy. always dress in their hotel. They wouldn't even, because there wasn't enough room. Yeah, you there know, wasn't enough room. It. it was just but beautiful. It was, uh, but atmosphere. On that trip that they came out, before those two, I think it was that same trip before they did the games in Oakland. And they made a stop in Sacramento. And you may remember this at American River College. Yeah, and they were, had a workout, and, yep. and the place was packed. Uh, to the rafters. Mm -hmm. you, know, and, you know, the gym at that time, I don't know, held 3,200, 3,400, something mm -hmm. like that. And these guys, Theus, Johnson Company, they come out on the floor, standing ovation. People are just, the place is, you couldn't get another body in there. And they're just looking around, what? I'd like, what in the world is going on? But people were so starved for an NBA presence and identity, and that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as, as you know, I mean, it just it this, just took off from there. Yeah, you know, I think, too, the thing, is always, of course, I was in Kansas City at that time, you know, a small college coach, and, of course, mm -hmm. the team practiced at my... So I had an association with them, but the interesting thing to me was that, that in Kansas City, the Kings just really weren't, were never... The big deal. No. And they had some really good teams. But I always remember Cotton Fitzsimmons, the late, great Cotton Fitzsimmons, said one time, he said, we're the, I think, the fourth franchise in town. And, you know, the, the Chiefs, Chiefs, the Royals, Royals, and Tom Watson is third. <laughs> and really, <laughs> at that time, it yeah. was true. Yeah. <laughs> you know. God, I love Cotton. He'd, he'd kind of growl at those guys and say, 
Give me close, boys, and let me win it for yeah, you down yeah. in the fourth quarter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he was, was a piece of work. He was a piece of work. I mean, great <laughs> I mean, I've known God since he was a junior college coach, and he was great then, too. Yeah. You know, I mean, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so so that got you, you know, of course, that I, my first remembrance of you, obviously, was as the, as the radio voice of the Kings, and uh, I always remember, I think, right away when the team came, and you know, I was part of it as a second assistant and everything, and and there'd be all kinds of events around town, and and then you you would be the the <laughs> master of ceremonies yeah. at everything, yeah. which I'm sure really paid zero. <laughs> <laughs> now that you mention it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but those were such fun times, and and you know to look back on that and to reflect and think about how the acceptance and and then the growth and the fact that. You know, the first, you know, I had no idea how long it would last. I later found out that, you know, they had to, for whatever, to meet certain, uh, I don't know if it's licensing or whatever, but they had to open the job up. And I was told that there were close to 100 applicants for the radio broadcast position, including some then announcers in the NBA who wanted to relocate to California. But what Greg Van Dusen, Dutch, had said from the beginning was, we want a local identity. Mm -hmm. And that's why, basically, he just said the job will be yours. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, I just, I had no inkling of how all of that worked. I was just young and dumb. Yeah. And it, and it took place. And here we are now 35 years later. Dutch was right. And (laughs) Joe was right. I mean, I mean, when you really think about besides your, your talent, I mean, it did make sense. You know, I think, I mean, I always remember a little unrelated thing, but I mean, Jim Thomas, uh, wanted me to do some TV and you were a mentor to me and I was just terrible. But, but I'm always remember what he said. He said, you know, I want somebody that is, a, you know, represents the Kings always mm-hmm. has. And people, you know, he was I, very perceptive. And, and I, respect. and I thought yeah. that honestly, did, yeah. you know, you look back, those things do make some sense, you know, not that, like I say, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I would have <laughs> wished they had to give me a little training. <laughs> well, and, and yeah, I had forgotten the, you know, the couple of years that I did television, and they, Grant went over on the radio side, mm-hmm. and we kind of we swapped roles. And that was really awkward because initially that was done in the middle of the season. Yeah, yeah. And I went, I had to tell Grant, I said, Grant, I don't know if you're even aware of this, but they want me to do the next game from the television side. And he, I, as I recall, was not aware of it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he handled it professionally. Yeah. And so that ended up, uh, I worked with Derek Dickey, and of course he ended up having a stroke and passed away. Yeah. And then I believe then's when you came into the mix yeah. from the television side. Yeah, I've actually, I came in, they had me doing some cable games before, okay. which was really unfair to Derek. And I mean, you know, I didn't, I was just doing what I was told, but I thought, I think they just wanted to get an idea mm-hmm. if I could do it or wouldn't be t- totally disastrous and, and that sort of thing. But, but well, anyway, but like you say, the communication was, uh, was, was very poor, I thought, you know, and I mean, it, it, it just really created a lot of, uh, you know, um, uncomfortableness for sure. Yeah, it was a bit awkward in a sense. But I, anytime I think about you and I doing television, I always flash on the playoff series against Seattle. Uh, my obligations to the network, sometimes I had to travel and I, I missed the games in Seattle because of some type of an assignment with oh, NBC. Oh, yeah. And I'm listening, watching in my hotel room. I think I was in Pennsylvania at the time and the Kings won the second game in the second series game. to even things at 1-1 before they were coming back to Arco. Yeah. And people were just going bonkers. It was, what, 96? something. 96, like, yeah, yeah. Against yeah. the Sonics. And it was a one versus eight situation. And so to split the first two on their floor was a big deal. Oh, a huge deal. And people, we came, Jerry and I came out to do our pregame and we're 20 minutes behind. We're doing our stand-up and the ovation and it never diminished. Never. I mean, you could not. We were standing next to each other, and you couldn't hear each other. No, I've always said it that, was that, crazy. That, that was the the obviously the loudest, most emotional crowd that I've ever been associated yeah. with. I really mean it was that. magical. It well, really was, and and I always remember the game, you know, back in Sacramento because you know Mitch Richmond had just simply beat the Sonics by himself. He was up there. He was the man in Seattle. You know, just took Peyton out of the game defensively and had thirty six or whatever. But anyway, and we were in position to win that next game. That's right. And then he, he, he got hurt. hurt. Yep. And, and they were really ready to take gas. You could see it. 
I mean, there was some gagging going on. <laughs> but when the rock went down, they they, yeah. they got new life. And I yeah. mean, it's one of those things you you know, as you know, when you're associated with it, you can see certain yeah. things. You know what's going on there. But uh, anyway, the yeah, I think a lot of times people have forgot that you you know you you did do TV for a while, and you know, and I always say that it was. I always look back on because that because that was my first experience, and uh, you know, like I say, just being totally, you know, I just. I mean, I I think I knew the game, but I didn't know how to fit in and stay. But it was out. good. It, I mean, it was natural. And I I mean, obviously, people know your background. You've done everything within the organization, and I've always just thought, good on you, Jerry Reynolds. I mean, I don't know that there's a role that you haven't had a hand in at somewhere along the line. And I, I just yeah, it seems I love that, that way. Some you I know, but that. I mean, it, it goes back to you know, like your background or my background. I mean, to where you you kind of I always said like with a player uh, in, in the league, I was telling them, find a way to be productive. You know, if you want to have a career, find a way yeah. to be productive. And I, I think, you know, it, it goes back to my father, I think, make, you know, reminding me it's up to you to f find a way to, to make your employers want to keep you and things like that. Find, you know, and but, it, you know, you're, there, there's, there's more to it. It's the relationships not only with the employers, but there was a perfect example at a game just last night involving the Kings and the Minnesota Timberwolves. And Jim Peterson, a former Kings player, I came down to say hello to him. He was talking with you, and he was laughing and joking about the fact that he says, you know, normally players loved the assistant coaches and they hated the head coach. But he said, with Jerry Reynolds, and Jerry was the head coach twice with the Kings, and Pete played under you for yeah. a period of time. And he said, I loved the head coach, and I didn't so much like the assistant coaches <laughs> yeah, no, who I, remain nameless at this yeah, point. Yeah, we, we'll let that, but <laughs> yeah, Pete, I mean, of course, i getting off the subject here, but I always remember the, the one great Jim Peterson story was in Milwaukee, and you'd remember it. Uh, Larry Kristoviak, and he was getting into it, and Jim was, I think, pinching him and this, that. Larry Kristoviak was a tough hombre. Tough, tough buckaroo. Ooh. And he turned and he popped Jim right in the snout. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I mean, he was out on his feet, kind of, you know, and I ran running out to, to, to check on him, you know, and he's he said, you know, he said, Coach, I, I can still play. I said, Jim, unless you can breathe out your ears, you can't play. Because his, no, his nose was, was – but, I mean, I, I was thinking now, that probably – not many guys today would have even – you know, they'd say, well, load management, i got to yep. have five games off here. But, but well, and just the fact that the game continued. I mean, there weren't, yeah. there weren't ejection or anything. That's just the way the That's game was played That's just the way the game time. was. And, yeah. and, and I always remember Pete and I kidding about it later, and I said, you know, because he said, I, you know, I brought it on myself. He didn't – he took blame for it. He, but I said, one thing we, we both learned is that Larry Kostoviak will never have to fight again <laughs> in the NBA. That's right. You know, that was – you know, it's he one proved. of those – yeah, it was one of those things that uh, the every, play and still e champion. Every, every player in the league said, "Okay, we won't that that we yeah. him him no <laughs> him no <laughs> <You Poor know>. Pete. <laughs> but I I mean you know you you go back through through some of the years you know I mean we just doing the Kings. Well, I, I tell you what I want to ask about you know obviously you had a great career in racing and I know you know the Indy stuff was really a yeah, big part good. of your life and meant yeah. meant a lot to you and and. Uh, because that was a couple of weeks a year that you would do that. And, of course, I grew up knowing, you know, the Indy, right. Indy 500 is the greatest thing since sliced and bread. And it's still an amazing uh, spectacle, and I, and I was blessed. To, I worked with the Speedway Radio Network for four or five years in the early mid-'80s. Uh, my friend Paul Page that I did a lot of events with at um, NBC, and he was the anchor voice of the Speedway Motor Racing Network. And... Uh, they had, I was told, and I don't know how much credibility, I don't know if they were blowing smoke, but they had a Hoosier rule. You had to be from Indiana to be part of the broadcast team. Oh. And then they made this exception because here's this California guy who knows the racing world and one thing or another, and I became part of their broadcast team. And that was really special. Uh, before that, even when working at uh, KCRA Television, every year of the month of May, uh, we would go back, uh, the late cameraman extraordinaire, Harry Sweet, mm -hmm. uh, he, we would go back to Indy, we'd spend a week, we'd generate about 30 different stories, feature type events, and we'd run them during each newscast the month of May. On the opposite side of the country is the Indy 500. But I was just totally infatuated with the magnitude of the event, and it was in its heyday at that time. Yeah. And you went there for qualifying, and there were over 200,000 people on qualifying. On qualifying. Weekends. I always tell people that nobody, I used yes. to go up there on qualifying. You know, it's just, I mean, Unbelievable. It was, it was, yeah. 
And then on race day, it was, you know, 350 to then, sometimes they would say 400,000 people. Those numbers may have been stretched a bit, but still. And I had an opportunity a couple of times, Jerry, uh, there were so many different things that I got to do during my network experience in so many different venues around the world that were just amazing. But riding in a pace car in front of 350 to 400,000 people at Indianapolis on the pace laps, when you look back over your shoulder and there's that field of 33 just, you know, weaving back and forth, generating a little heat in the tires, they're ready to roar and go. I mean, the hair stands up on my arms when I think about that. But just an idea of some of the things, racing was a huge part of what I did on the network level. But I did a bit of everything. I did everything from sumo wrestling to NFL football. Oh, really? I, I didn't did realize. eight years of NFL uh, football. Uh, a lot of people don't, didn't realize. Yeah, and I, I would did just, not realize. Those were, those were wonderful times and great opportunities. And the best part of it probably, and I, I don't want to stray too far here, but it was just, it was the tail end of an era when the networks were absolute kings. Mm-hmm. There wasn't the proliferation of cable, cable outlets. There weren't podcasts. There wasn't social media. There was none of that. Right. It was ABC, NBC, CBS, and usually there were one or two independent stations in any major market, and that was it. So money was no object, and I got in on the tail end of that. And the experiences when, you know, we'd go to do events and we'd fly into Heathrow in London, a driver in a Bentley was there to pick you up, to take you to your hotel, take you to your venue where you were working the next day, and then take your wife castle hopping or whatever she wanted to do. Gee, and man. the fact that, you know, by contract, I could take Marlene three times a year on any international junket of my choice. And she, you know, got oh. paid per diem and she was treated, everything was first class. But to be able to experience that and now to look back on that, and of course, everything is so bottom line conscious now. Sure. And young people, I mean, they, they can't believe how network folks and i was at the bottom of the totem pole Mm -hmm. but the way we were treated Mm -hmm. and it was it was really special yeah i was gonna say it's really that that ship has sailed hadn't it It, a long time ago (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah now now you did uh uh cart uh you did some cart racing. yeah championship auto racing teams was an indycar version they ended up with a split that almost killed the sport of indycar racing and i loved indycar i spent 25 years doing indycar racing I did virtually every kind of motorsports imaginable. I did motorcycles. I did Formula One. I did NASCAR. I did unlimited uh, hydroplanes. Drag you know, racing and you know all, the, all that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. And I I thoroughly have enjoyed it. Uh, so you know I got nearly forty years of the of the network experience of being able to do that. And uh, it was initially it was NBC. Then it became ABC. And of course the Disney company is the parent company for ESPN, ABC, etc. So there was a bit of overlap and uh, had some extraordinary times. Yeah, you know, it does seem like, uh, to me at least, uh, that IndyCar racing is coming back a bit. You know, that There's a resurgence a, now. A bit yeah. of a resurgence. I mean, I think some of my son and I talk about it all the time. I think a part of it is that NASCAR's just dying almost. You yeah, know? they I went mean, through it, a, a great resurgence and they had, you know, when they were the hottest ticket around and they were the absolute king of motorsports, and they still are. But it's uh, diminished, diminished a, greatly a lot over yeah. the last five to seven years. Yeah, worried me because Roger ain't... Penske has has just become involved as the owner of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That oh. just happened within the last couple of months, and Roger Penske's name um, with the Speedway and then owning the IndyCar series, uh, I think that we'll see even bigger steps in terms of growth in the mm-hmm. future. So I'm I'm very excited about what may be happening there. And that well, sense. it'd be great. Uh, just a Hoosier yeah. that grew up, like you said, you know. With, Gentlemen, start your engines, and it's, it's I mean, ingrained there, in you. There's, yeah, there's it's, nothing, it's part of your heritage. Nothing you better than that. And in India. so, uh, just uh, you know, going back, you know, through the years with the Kings, obviously, uh, you know, there's so many neat times. Uh, you know, are there anything, any kind of games that just particularly you remember, or anything strange or un- unusual? Well, I mean. I think we're all drawn to dramatic conclusions, buzzer-beating finishes. Yeah. The Mike Bibby shot in the playoffs against the Lakers is certainly very high yeah. on the list. Um, Tyreek Evans, half-court runner half with a half-second to go to beat Memphis. Just and people forget back, the you know, the O.J. Mayo shot right before that exactly. was incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, you know, you fast forward and just here a couple of weeks ago, 
The Kings, after Russell Westbrook for Houston, drives the length of the floor. Rockets have a two-point lead. One second to One go. One second to Inbounds go. to Bielitsa, and Billy knocks down a 33-35 footer to yep. win the ball game at the buzzer. Those are, those are always memorable. But, you know, equally memorable to me, unfortunately, are some of the nights when the Kings got absolutely blasted, yeah. losing by 62 to the yeah. Warriors, yeah. losing by 58, I think it was, to Milwaukee, yeah. or that first year. First year, yeah. To, oh, gosh. Yeah, 58 in, uh, in Milwaukee. In I always Milwaukee. remember that. And We'd... we came home to the Christmas party at the yeah. old Wood Lake Inn. Old Wood Lake Inn. At the, day, the next day. Yep. And everybody, you know, we oh. were so down. I mean, we just got crushed. I'm a new broadcaster, rookie season. You lose by 58. 58. I don't know how to handle that. You know, it's one of those deals, too. It, it, we'd beaten Chicago the night before. See, okay. no, I had forgotten that. Yeah, we beat the Bulls, and, you know, and then not that, you know, obviously the, the Milwaukee was very good, but, I mean, yeah. but they, but they just, you know, 50, but 58, you know, we weren't quite ready. And I'm well, like you, I was my first year in the league, and I was thinking, you know, you should <laughs> never get beat 58, but, like, you know. We go happened. to the Christmas party at the Wood Lake. Joe Axelson puts an arm around me and just says, you know, there are going to be nights like this, yeah. and you have to find a way to accept it and move on, move yeah. on to the next opportunity. And, and, of course, we've come to, to learn and know that. Then but, you, you mentioned Chicago. There was that great uh, Tyreek's rookie year. Th Kings are down yeah, 35, 35 in the third, in the third quarter. quarter, and they win the ball game. I, that's always my, my, oh my God. standard, you know, because Grant sometimes will be talking about, oh, that's the game. I said, Grant, always remember, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and I think we found out last year, I think, uh, Brooklyn, uh, we had we were up 20 something in the fourth quarter. That's right. We had 27 point lead, late third, 25 point lead going to the fourth. And got beat and, by. Uh, who was what, it? D'Angelo Russell, Russell just went for uh, 27 in the yeah, fourth he quarter. He thought he was Michael Jordan there. And he quarter. was. And he was. For 12 minutes. Yeah. And so, he killed us. Yeah, it's just amazing, <laughs> you know, with the, you know, that type of thing where you see such miraculous things. You know, you remember the, obviously the Clay Thompson 37 oh, point yeah. quarter. To, I mean, to this day, I mean, that's the most amazing thing I've ever witnessed. I totally agree. In 35 years in the NBA. We've yeah. seen some stuff. Yes. But for a guy to score 37 points and to do it the way he did, never missed a shot. I don't he think was, he take, even took two dribbles, I don't think. He was think. totally unconscious. I remember one of them, the basket's over here. He's standing here. The ball comes to him, and in the same motion, the shot, he hadn't even looked. No. And the shot's off, nothing but net. Yeah. He didn't miss a shot in that. 12 minutes. No, I mean, that's... it was the most astounding thing I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I was going to say. I, I And an NBA record for all time. Yeah, so, I mean, all time. I can't imagine how it'd be beaten, you know. And, I mean, people would say, well, you know, how'd that well, – I don't know how that happened, but, I, I mean, I, I, some of them were tough shots, you know. Absolutely. I mean, some Absolutely. Of them, he just uh, simply a great performance. Uh, you Incredible know, time. Mean... <laughs> now, think, this is the holiday time, but we're, we're recording this podcast. There was a early 90s, the Walt Williams days – and the Kings had back-to-back -back wins. Yeah, over 50 points. 58 and 56-point back-to-back wins. Yeah. Which I don't believe has ever been duplicated in the annals no. of NBA basketball. And I think basketball. there was a third one in there. Uh, I'm pretty sure Denver came in and we beat them for like 35. That I had forgotten. And, and, and having said all that, that team won like 27, 28 games. So, I mean, yeah, I yeah. guess the point is you never know you never on know. a given night what's likely yeah. to happen. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's... Uh, the I, blind squirrel finds some, an acorn once in a while. Well, I always say some <laughs> nights, the, as you know, the, the schedule will win you some games. Yes. And the schedule will lose you some yeah. games. I mean, just... By and you name. always win some you don't expect to win, and you lose some you don't expect to lose. Right. I keep reminding myself of that a lot. Lately. Getting harder, <laughs> getting harder, getting harder, G. Getting a lot harder, but but it, but it's true. And I mean, I think for the, you know, just watching the, the some of the Christmas games mm -hmm. uh, where you know New Orleans goes into Denver and wins. Yeah. Uh, you know, Warriors took care Warrior, of the Rockets. Warriors beat the Rockets. I mean, yeah. it's it, you know, and I think even the weaker teams always they always have some really good yeah. players. Well, that's what that's why we love the NBA. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it just and I you know people say, well, don't you get tired of it? Well, no, no. I, I don't. I don't think you do either. No. And I know that you're like me. We got league pass, and on off nights, you're jumping around. No. You're looking at six different games. Oh, and absolutely. Honing in on maybe a next opponent. You do a little scouting. Or it's just an entertaining game. It's because we love basketball. Yeah, we, the ball. You know, I always said the ball goes up. I, I'm, I'm still excited. Somebody you asked know? me the other day. Said, "How many games are you up to now?" And I said, "Well, 
I, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's over 2,700. And I started thinking wow. about that. That's a lot of basketball that's games. That's a lot of football. basketball games. I, I'd have to think that's got to be the record in the league, mm, I would think. I don't know. No, I don't think so. You well, m- among those who are active, I mean, mm, oh, Chick, uh-huh. had, Chick Hearn had more than that. Ralph Lawler, who just retired this year with the Clippers, he had done more games more than, than that. Okay. Uh, George Blaha in Detroit, possibly. Still, still working, yeah. yeah. But then, yeah, it, it's... Uh, it's a small group. It's a small group, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's a lot of basketball. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of losing basketball yeah. along the way. Well, you know, the thing I think, too, uh, we talk about a little bit is, is, is you know, like in, in your job, and, and I would, like say, I just marvel at it because I, I love to... I can't watch a game. You just listen to you, or you you paint the game, you know, and, and so I see it, and, and that's great. But having said all that, now so many places you have to, you're so far up. They've taken yeah. ra- radio, and I think it's really terrible to be honest. But but I mean, make because I know even the TV part we do, you know, we're doing s- several yep. uh, up. And it just changes. It just changes. Totally changes. Make it so much harder. The first twenty-five years, you did every game on the floor in every arena. Now, from radio standpoint, there are only four places of the thirty different teams, or four teams where you're still on the floor. On the floor. Uh, Phoenix, Chicago, Toronto, Detroit. That's it. Wow. And in Toronto and Detroit, you're in a second or a third row, and you're peering around people, and you've got fans in those front rows that are in your vision. They jump up, and that blocks a third of the floor from. So I mean, there are yeah, there are some real challenges, and it's. I know that from my standpoint, I call the game differently now than I used to, because I want to be accurate, mm-hmm. and I know that there are two or three times, particularly early in a game, where you're seeing an opponent for the first time, and trying to discern, okay, is that number that I'm seeing an eight, a six, a five, a three, uh, the Washington Wizards. Oh, Bless okay. their hearts, but they have uniforms with a band running right through the middle of the number, and you cannot tell. Cannot tell. An eight, a nine, a six, a five, a three. It just drives you crazy as a broadcaster. And one of the things that I mean, I mean, this is when I get on my soapbox, and the league doesn't, I mean, they don't care about radio. Mm-hmm. Television generates the revenue, yeah, and it's the... network television, not so much even local yeah, television. Yeah, no, it's network television. But at any rate, in the 15 minutes when they come out for their formal warm-ups, if the league would just mandate and say, you must have the number of your uniform on the sleeve or on the hip of your warm-up, that would give broadcasters like myself an opportunity. Okay, the guy with the dreadlocks is so-and-so. The guy with who's wearing the flashy green shoes tonight is so-and-so. so-and-so. But now you don't know until they peel off the sweats at starting lineups and you get ready for the opening tip. Yeah. So it really... And I don't, I don't ever want to sound like I'm whining or complaining because I'm blessed to have the job that I do, and I love that fact. But by the same token, they could make your life as a broadcaster so much easier so, with the simple little changes. Yeah, and really, I mean, and, and obviously they should because it helps do the job better, you know, and, and you know, basically, I mean, you yeah, should be Yeah, I mean, it seems thinking, like a no-brainer. Yeah, but you know, I mean, I, that's... Kind of like, I mean, even in television, I think so many places now are at least on the second row. Yep. And as you said, I mean... More that, and more that, places are starting to move television up. television back, yeah. you know, because they can sell those seats. Yeah. And I guess I get it to a, to a small degree, but not, I really don't agree with that. I, I don't think they should... You know, to me, yeah. it's like, wait a minute here. You're, a lot of your fans aren't at the game. Well, you know, I've never known numbers in terms of how, what kind of an audience we have from a radio standpoint. Uh, but I do know that when the Kings are on the East Coast and we're playing at uh, travel time, you know, commute time, Mm -hmm. when people are getting out of work and going home one thing or another, I know that our audiences are higher. Right, right, yeah. People are listening and checking on the Kings, how they're doing. And you just, you want to do the job as a professional, you want to do it correctly. You want to have the energy and the the excitement, but it's hard if you're, you have to kind of tone it down because you're trying to identify Mm-hmm. people and i that bothers me yeah no but it just that's i mean yeah that's the nature of the beast and you have to deal beast. with it yeah. yeah is there any uh you know I, people always ask me a little bit some of your favorite cities to to visit and your maybe your least favorite cities anything come to mind uh, along well i've never the years? forgiven the league and i think you stand with me yeah. on this <laughs> for trading vancouver for memphis tennessee oh, we'll never forgive them there are wonderful people in memphis Absolutely. and yes there's great barbecue in memphis 
but Memphis is not Vancouver, British Columbia. Nope. By any stretch of the imagination. I miss Vancouver, British Columbia a lot. A lot. I love that city. A beautiful city. And uh, at any rate, I, I, the Canadians, I love going to Toronto. Mm-hmm. I like Chicago a lot. I love New York. I'm a theater and arts person. I love the chance to go to Broadway and squeeze in a show while we're there. Uh, so those are probably my favorites. Um, I'm not a big fan of, you know, Memphis, Milwaukee, Cleveland. Again, great people in the organizations and yeah. one thing or another, and they, they go out of their way to make you feel at home and all of that. But it's, it's just, there's a difference between Chicago and Milwaukee, even though they're only 90 miles apart yeah, or something yeah. oh, like that. Oh, absolutely. So can't. it's, yeah, those, those are some that I really, I, Boston is a great city to walk in oh, and I the culture it, yeah. there. And, and I enjoy Boston an awful lot. Yeah, I always say yeah. when it's nice weather to, to be walk to Boston Common, yep. uh, you know, or in New York Central Park. Or and you're a walker. Me, and I'm a walker. This man, I, I he really, can tell you about places I, to walk. I, I mean, and so I, and, and really just with New York, uh, you know, there's so many different and unique areas. Yes. So it's all for, uh, for years, I was scared of New York, you know, being a country bumpkin, you know. I, <laughs> I mean, I think I spent three or four years never left the hotel except to get in the bus to go to the game. <laughs> and then really the last, you know, 20 years have come to yeah. truly enjoy it, you know. Yeah. But but I like to say... There's, there's a something. vibrancy in that city. It's uh, it's amazing. It's like it's not like any other in that sense. No, I mean, you know, you want a, a sandwich at 2 o'clock, yeah, you just exactly. walk out of the hotel and probably yeah. go half a block and there's a good place to get one. Yeah. You know, it's really, really remarkable. But, you know, you do, you know, we always think about, you know, you look back through the years, so there's so many neat players. It's been so much fun to be around. You know, there have been Absolutely. a few difficult ones. But, I mean, each era you know, just had their special guys, you know, the, in my yeah. mind, you know, the Reggies and the yeah. Mike Woodsons and Eddie Wasn't Johnson. it great when they closed the old arena the night they had so many players from various decades yes, it come was. back? Yes. And you had a chance to, you know, to say hello to a Dwayne Coswell and a Walt Williams and, and, and different folks like that that sometimes we kind of lose track of. But but over the years, you're right. I mean, and we've been blessed. We The Kings family has has been touched with so many really good people and it's it's fun to be able to you know renew acquaintances and to see these guys and to catch up on them and their families and, and too you know i always tell people a lot of times i mean some of the the nicest guys the most pleasant guys may not be the best players you know and sometimes the best players may not be the yeah. nicest most pleasant people in all cases <laughs> but you know the, it's just re- the real world you know the, but you have some you know, just I always say, you know, some delightful people, the Pete Chilcutts or the Francisco Garcias or Jimmy Lestis. There that, you go. That, you know, that, okay, but but on a day-to-day basis, you know, they're just, you know. They didn't put up the big numbers. They yeah. weren't, the, you know, the marquee players in the NBA. Yeah. But they were quality individuals. Quality individuals. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I We could, I know I could <laughs> probably talk with you for another five hours or so. We we maybe overextended our stay here. I well, sure. I don't know, but it's been obviously you know there's so many we've had so many experiences together. So some not so good, some good, you know. But but I, I always just think that probably one of the things I've missed from traveling with the team is just sitting behind you on the plane and and watching watching you work while I'm just eating or or, or, or whatever. I, I've always just I mean I think it's one of the the real treats of. Uh, any people that come to the Kings and, and you know for the first time and and watching the G Man talk about the ult- ultimate pro and and uh, I wish I could say I was but uh, you know hey well I, I wish I had one of those minds that retained things and I didn't have to put down you know have fingertip information that I can make references to but I'm always have been a big believer you do your homework you be prepared yeah and you know and maybe you're over prepared and you know I've heard good broadcasters say that you know. You take a list of different things that you can touch on at various times in the broadcast. You get into a blowout scenario. And the other night we were in one of those and the Kings were getting thumped. And I'm talking about the experience of going to some place to eat or one thing or another. But people remember things like that. And frequently they do. it comes back and they talk about it. But back to that whole business, you, you, you get overprepared. And maybe you only use uh, 10, 20% of what you have on that list. But... You're, you're ready to hopefully handle any type of scenario. In one of those situations where, oh, there's a leak in the roof. Isn't yeah. that Greg Lukenbill up there in the <laughs> yeah. rafters, you know? Oh. And 43 minutes go by before we resume play. Yeah. That happened at the old Larco. 
We had a situation in Philadelphia a couple of years ago when yeah, the condensation did. on the floor couldn't and play the game, having to postpone the game. Yeah, but yet we had to fill an hour and a half between the studio and on site. Maybe it was closer to two hours. But uh, you know, you never know when those things are going to happen. Yeah, and you like know, that. you almost never know the some of the backstory. I was, I mean, off the subject here a little bit, but the uh, the, the Greg Lukenville game, the water dripping game, you know, and forty minute delay, and we we're playing the seventy uh, sixers. Seventy sixers. They played the night before and had a big win or something, but we were up big, and and Charles Barkley was done. He was, you know, he was gassed. He, he was didn't good. want any more, and 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 I remember. Looking down, there's two things. I said, well, first of all, Greg's going to fall down and go splat, and we're going to lose a owner. <laughs> but then after about 20 minutes, I was looking down. I remember looking down at the, at, at the 76ers bench, and I said, damn, Barkley is ready to go. And I said, and he we're was. in trouble. When and we were. The game. And yep. we were. Yep. And, you know, and but yep. I mean, it's like one of those little things that, you yep. know, that you kind of. Had you know, him on the ropes. Had him on the ropes. But the reason we had him on the ropes was was the reason and, they got off the ropes. Luke and Bill is up there and they're climbing around on the rafters with no safety harness oh, or anything. I mean. And that was, that was a that was crazy a, night. I mean, he, well, he was Greg Luke and Bill. We've I had mean, some experience. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Mm. And on that note, I, I guess we'll uh, <laughs> probably leave it here for now, but I uh, really want to thank you thank for coming you. in. It's That's been fun. just a really enjoyable uh, yeah. couple of Parts going back <laughs> <laughs> over the over the good times and the bad times. Yes, we and we've had a bunch of them. Yes, we have. So thanks again to Thank Gary you. Gerald, a true legend in uh, Sacramento.